Book 21. But now the goddess, gray-eyed Athene, put it in the mind of the daughter Achirios, circumspect Penelope, to set the bow before the suitors and the gray iron in the house of Odysseus, the contests, the beginning of the slaughter. So she ascended the highest staircase of her own house, and in her solid hand took up the beautiful, brazen, and artfully curved key with an ivory handle upon it. With her attendant women, she went to the inmost recess of the chamber. There were stored away the master's possessions. Bronze was there, and gold, and difficulty wrought, difficultly wrought iron. And there the backstrung bow was stored away, and the quiver to hold the arrows. There were many painful shafts inside it. These were gifts from a friend whom he met in Lake Daemon, Iphidos, son of Eurydos, one like the immortal gods. These two in Messene had encountered each other in the house of wise Ortolokos, at the time when Odysseus went there on an errand enjoined by the whole community. For men of Messene had come in ships with many oarlocks and lifted 300 sheep from Ithaca, also the herdsmen with them. So Odysseus traveled far on the embassy while still a boy, sent by his father and the rest of the elders. Iphidos was there in search of his horses, 12 mares he had lost, hard-working mule colts, colts were with them, nursing. These mares presently were to mean his doom and murder at the time when he came to the son of Zeus, strong-hearted, the man called Heracles, guilty of monstrous actions, who killed Iphitos while he was a guest in his household, hard man without shame for the watchful gods, nor the table he had set for Iphitos' guests. And when he had killed him, he kept the strong-footed horses for himself in his palace. In search of his mares, Iphitos met Odysseus, and gave him the bow, which once the great Eurytos had carried, and left it afterward to his son when he had died in his high house. Odysseus gave him a sharp-turned sword and a strong spear to begin their considerate friendship, but these two never entertained each other. Before that, the son of Zeus killed Iphitos, son of Eurytos, one like the immortal gods, who gave Odysseus the bow. But Odysseus never took it with him when he went to war on the black ships, but always it was stored away in the halls in memory of a dear friend. But he carried it at home in his country. When he shining, when she, shining among women, had come to the chamber and had come up to the oaken threshold, which the carpenter once had expertly planed and drawn it true to a chalk line, and fitted the doorpost to it and joined on the shining door leaves, First, she quickly set the fastening free of the hook. Then she inserted the key and knocked the bolt upward, pushing the key straight in. And the door bellowed aloud as a bull does when he feeds in his pasture. Such was the noise the splendid doors made, struck with the key, and now they quickly spread open. Then she went up to the high platform where there were standing chests, and in these were stored fragrant pieces of clothing. From there... She reached and took the bow from its peg where it hung, in its own case, a shining thing that covered it. Thereupon, she sat down and laid the bow on her dear knees, while she took her lord's bow out of its case, all the while weeping aloud. But when she had sated herself with tears and crying, she went on her way to the hall to be with the lordly suitors, bearing in her hand the backstrung bow and the quiver to hold the arrows, with many sorrowful shafts inside it. Her serving women carried the box for her, and there lay much iron and bronze, prizes that had been won by the master. When she, shining among women, came near the suitors, she stood by the pillar that supported the roof with its joinery, holding her shining veil in front of her face to shield it, and a devoted attendant was stationed on either side of her. Now at once she spoke and addressed a word to the suitors. Hear me now, you haughty suitors, who have been using this house for your incessant eating and drinking, though it belongs to a man who has been gone a long time. Never have you been able to bring any other saying before me, but only your desire to make me your wife and marry me. But come, you suitors, since here is a prize set out before you, for I shall bring you the great bow of godlike Odysseus, and the one who takes the bow in his hand, strings it with the greatest ease, and sends an arrow clean through all the twelve axes, shall be the one I go away with, forsaking this house, where I was a bride, a lovely place and full of good living. I think that even in my dreams, I shall never forget it. So she spoke and told the noble swineherd Eumaeus to put the bow and the gray iron in front of the suitors. 
Eumaeus accepted it in tears and put them before them. And the oxherd also wept when he saw the bow of his master. But Antinous scolded the two of them and spoke out and named them. You foolish countrymen who never think of tomorrow, poor wretches. Why are you streaming tears and troubling the lady now and stirring her heart when she has enough already of sadness her heart rests on? Now she has lost a dear husband. Go and sit in silence and eat, or else take your crying out of the door and be gone. But leave the bow where you put it, a prize for the suitors to strive for, a terrible one. I do not think that this well-polished bow can ever be strung easily. There is no man among the lot of us who is such a one as Odysseus used to be. I myself have seen him, and I remember well, though I was still young and childish. So he spoke, but the spirit inside his heart was hopeful that he should be able to string the bow and shoot through the iron. But he was to be the first to get a taste of to the arrow from the hands of blameless Odysseus, to whom he now paid no attention, as he sat in Odysseus' halls and encouraged all his companions. Now the hallowed prince Telemachus spoke his words to them. Ah, how Zeus, the son of Cronus, has made me witless. My own beloved mother, though she is sensible, tells me that she'll forsake this house and go away with another. And then in the witlessness of my heart, I laugh and enjoy it. But come, you suitors, since here is a prize set out before you, a woman, there is none like her in all the Achean, Achean country, neither in sacred Pylos, nor Argos, nor Mycenae, nor here in Ithaca itself, nor in the dark mainland. You yourselves also know this. Then why should I praise my mother? But come, no longer drag things out with delays, not turn back still from the stringing of the bow, so we may see it. I myself am also willing to attempt the bow. Then if I can put the string on it and shoot through the iron, my queenly mother would not go off with another and leave me sorrowing here in the house, since I would still be found here as one now able to take up my father's glorious prizes. He spoke and sprang upright, Laying aside from his shoulders the red cloak, and from his shoulders, too, took off the sharp sword, he began by setting up the axes, digging one long trench for all of them, and drawing it true to a chalk line, and stamped down the earth around them. Wonder seized the onlookers at how orderly he set them up. He never had seen them before. He went then and tried the bow, standing on the threshold. Three times he made it vibrate, straining to bend it, and three times he gave over the effort. Yet in his heart was hopeful of hooking the string to the bow and sending a shaft through the iron. And now, pulling the bow for the fourth time, he would have strung it, but Odysseus stopped him, though he was eager, making a signal with his head. The hallowed prince, Telemachus, said to them, Shame on me! I must then be a coward and weakling, or else I am still young, and my hands yet have no confidence to defend myself against a man who has started a quarrel. Come then! You who, are, you who in your strength are greater than I am, make your attempts in the bow, and let us finish the contest. So he spoke, and put the bow bef from him, leaning it on the ground, and against the compacted and polished door leaves, and in the same place leaned the swift shaft against the fine handle, and went back and sat in the chair from which he had risen. Now Antinous, the son of e e Eupethes, said to him, Take your turns in order from left to right, my companions, all beginning from the place where the wine is served out. So spoke Antinous, and his word was pleasing to all of them. Leodes was the first to rise, the son of Oinops, who was a diviner among them, and sat always in the corner beside the fine mixing bowl. To him alone their excess were hateful, and he disapproved of all the suitors. He was the first to take up the bow and the swift arrow now. He went then and tried the bow, standing on the threshold, and could not string it. Before that, he ruined his soft, uncallous hands, pulling at the string, and now he spoke to the suitors, Friends, I cannot string this. Let one of the others take it. Here is a bow such that it will sunder many of the princes from life and soul, since truly it is far better to die than go on living and fail of that for whose sake we forever keep on gathering here all our days in expectation. Now a man may be hopeful, and in his heart desirous of marrying Penelope, the wife of Odysseus. But when the bow has been attempted, and all is made plain, then one must court some other fair-robed Acacian woman, and strive to win her with gifts of courtship. She will then marry the man she is fated to have, and who brings her the greatest presence. So he spoke, and put the bow from him, leaning it on the ground, and against the compacted and polished door leaves. 
and in the same place, leaned the swift shaft against the fine handle and went back and sat in the chair from which he had risen. But now Antinous scolded him and spoke out and named him, Leodes, what sort of word escaped your teeth's barrier? A terrible and shameful word. I am outraged to hear it. If this is to be such a bow that will sunder the princes from life and soul because you are unable to string it, you are not such a one when the lady your mother bore you as, as ever to be able to manage the bow and the arrows, but presently the other lordly suitors will string it. So he spoke, and now urge Melanthios, the goatherd. Come now, Melanthios, light us a fire inside the palace, and set beside it a great chair with fleeces upon it, and bring out from the inside stores of great wheel of tallow, so that we young men, having heated the bow and rubbed it with fat, can then attempt to bend it and finish the contest. So he spoke, and Melanthios quickly kindled the weariless fire, and brought out the chair and laid the fleeces upon it, and brought out from the inside the stores a great wheel of tallow. The young man heated the bow and tried it, but were not able to string it. They were not nearly strong enough. All this time, Antinous still held back, as did godlike Eurymachos, those lords of the suitors, out and away the best men among them. Two men, the oxherd and the swineherd of godlike Odysseus, went out of the house, in company keeping close together. And a great Odysseus himself came from the house to join them. But after they were out of the way of the doors in the courtyard, Odysseus spoke to the two of them in words of endearment. Oxherd, and you too, swineherd, shall I say something to you, or keep it hidden within? My spirit tells me to speak out. What sort of fight would you put up in defense of Odysseus, if he were to come suddenly, so with the god leading him? Would you fight for the suitors, or would you fight for Odysseus? Tell me what your heart and spirit would have you answer. Then the herdsmen of oxen spoke in turn and answered him, Father Zeus, if you would achieve this prayer I ask for, that the man himself would come home with the divinity guiding him, then you yourself would see what kind of strength my hands have. So, Eumaeus also prayed to all the divinities that they would grant the homecoming of thoughtful Odysseus. But when Odysseus had recognized the infallible temper of these men, then he spoke to them again and answered them, I am he. I am here in my house. After many sufferings, I have come home in the twentieth year to the land of my fathers. And now I see that all of my men, when it was only you two who wanted me to come, I have not heard one of the others prying that I should return again and come to my own house. Therefore I will tell you the truth, and so it shall be. If by my hand the God overmasters the lordly suitors, then I shall get wives for you both, and grant you possessions and houses built next to mine, and think of you in the future always as companions of Telemachus and his brothers. But come now, let me show you a proof that shall be manifest, so you may know me for sure and trust my identity. That scar which once the boar with his white tooth inflicted on me when I went to Parnosus with the sons of Autolycos. So he spoke, and pushed back the rags that covered the, his great scar. When these two had examined it and recognized everything, they burst out weeping and threw their arms around wise Odysseus, and made much of him, and kissed him on his head and his shoulders. And so Odysseus also kissed their heads and hands. Now the sun would have gone down while they were still thus clamoring, had not Odysseus stayed with them from it and said a word to them. Now, stop your lamentation and wailing, or someone may come out from the hall and see us, and tell about it inside. So rather, let us go in severally, not all together. I first, you after me, but let us have this as a signal arranged. For all the others there, who are lordly suitors, will not say that you can give the, me the bow and the quiver. But you must carry the bow through the house, noble Emaeus, and put it into my hands, and then you must tell the women to bar the tightly fitted doors that close the hall. Tell them if any of them hears from inside the crash and the outcry of men who are caught within our toils, they must not peep in from outside, but simply sit still at their work in silence. Noble Philoetius, your task is to make fast the courtyard door with the bolt. So your, your task is to make fast the courtyard do door with the bolt and tie the fastening quickly upon it. So he spoke, and went into the established palace, and went back and sat in the chair from which he had risen. And after him the two thralls of godlike Odysseus entered. Eurymachus by now had taken the bow and handled it, turning it round and round by the blaze of the fire, but even so he could not string it, and his proud heart was harrowed. Deeply vexed he spoke to his own great-hearted spirit, 
O my sorrow, here is a grief beyond all others. It is not so much the marriage I grieve for, for all my chagrin. There are many Achaean women besides, some of them close by in secret Ithaca, and some in the rest of the cities. But it is thought, if this is true, that we come so far short of God like Odysseus in strength, so that we cannot even string his bow, a shame for men on board to be told of. Then, in turn, Antinous, son of Euphethes, answered, It will not happen that way, Eurymachos. You yourself know this. Now there is a holy feast in the community for the god. Who could string bows then? Put it away now for our good time. But we shall leave all the axes standing where they are. I do not believe anyone will come in and steal them away from the halls of Odysseus, son of Laertes. Come, let the wine steward pour a round of wine in the goblets so we can make a libation and put away the curved bow. Then at dawn instruct Melanthios, who is the goat herd, to bring in goats, those far the best in all the goat flocks, so that dedicating the thighs to the glorious archer, Apollo, we can attempt the bow and finish the contest. So spoke Antinous, and his word was pleasing to all of them. The heralds poured water over their hands to wash with, and the young men filled the mixing bowls with wine for their drinking, and passed to all after they had offered a drink in the goblets. But when they had poured and drunk each as much as he wanted, resourceful Odysseus spoke to them in crafty intention. Hear me now, you who are suitors of our glorious queen, while I speak out what the heart within my breast urges. Above all, I entreat Eurymachos and the godlike Antinous, since what he said also was fair and orderly. Let the bow be for the time, give it over to the, to the divinities, and tomorrow the god will give success to whomever he wishes. But come now, give me the well-polished bow, so that among you I may try out my strength and hands to see if I still have force in my flexible limbs, as there has been in past times, or whether my wandering and lack of good care ruined me. So he spoke, but all of them were wildly indignant, and feared that he might take the well-polished bow and string it. Now Antinous scolded him and spoke out and named him. Ah, wretched stranger, you have no sense, not even a little. Is it not enough that you dine in peace among us, who are violent men, and are deprived of no fair portion, but listen to our conversation and what we say? But there is no other vagabond and newcomer who is allowed to hear us, who is allowed to hear us talk. The honeyed wine has hurt you, as it has distracted others as well, who gulp it down without drinking in season. It was, also, it was wine also that drove the centaur, famous Eurotian, distracted in the palace of the great-hearted Perithos when he visited Lapiths. His brain went wild with drinking, and in his fury he did much harm in the house at Perathios. Grief and rage then seized the heroes. They sprang up and dragged him through the forecourt and outside, with the pitiless brawn severing his ears and nose, and he, having had his brains bewildered, knew what a disaster his unstable spirit had got him. Since his time, there has been a feud between men and centaurs, and he was the first who found his own evil and heavy drinking. So I announce great trouble for you as well. If ever you string this bow, you will meet no kind of courtesy in our group, but we shall put you into a black ship and take you over to King Echetus, one who mutilates all men. There you will lose everything. Sit and be quiet and drink your wine nor quarrel with men who are younger than you are. Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, Antinous, it is neither fair nor just to browbeat any guest of Telem Telemachus who comes to visit him. Do you imagine that if this stranger, in the confidence of hands and strength, should string the great bow of Odysseus, that he would take me home with him and make me his wife? No, he himself has no such thought in the heart of, within him. Let none of you be sorrowful at heart in his feasting here for such a reason. There is no likelihood of it. And now, Eurymachos, the son of Polybos, answered, Daughter of Icarios, circumspect Penelope, we do not think he will take you away. That is not likely. But we are ashamed to face the talk of men and the women, for fear some other Achaean who is meaner than we are might say, Far baser men are courting the wife of a stately man. They are not even able to string his bow. Then another, some beggar man, came wandering in from somewhere and easily strung the bow and sent a shaft through the iron. So they will speak, and that would be a disgrace on all of us. Circumspect Penelope said to him in answer, Eurymachos, there can be no glory among our people in any case, for those who eat away and dishonor the house of a great man. Why be concerned over reproaches? 
But this stranger is a very big man, and he is built strongly, and also he claims to be the son of a noble father. Come then, give him the polished bow. Let us see what happens, for I tell you this straight out, and it will be a thing accomplished. If he can string the bow, and Apollo gives him that glory, I will give him fine clothing to wear, a mantle and tunic, and give him sharp javelin to keep men and dogs off, and give him sandals for his feet, a sword with two edges, and send him wherever his heart and spirit desire to be sent. Then the thoughtful Telemachus said to her in answer, My mother, no Achaean man has more authority over this bow than I to give or withhold at my pleasure. Not one of those who are lords here in rocky Ithaca, not one of those in islands off horse pasturing Ellis. No one can force me against my will. If I want, I can give it to the stranger as an outright gift to take away with him. Go therefore back into the house and take up your own work, the loom and the distaff, and see to it that your handmaidens ply their work also. The men shall have the bow in their keeping, all men, but I most of all, for mine is a power in this household. Penelope went back inside the house in amazement, for she laid the serious words of her son deep away in her spirit. And she went back to the upper story with her attendant women, and wept for Odysseus, her beloved husband, until grey-eyed Athene cast sweet slumber over her eyelids. Now the noble swineherd took the curved bow and carried it, but all the suitors in the palace cried out against him. And thus would go the word of one of these arrogant young men, Why are you carrying the bow, you sorry and shiftless swineherd? Those swift dogs that you raise yourself with feet on you beside your pigs, forsaken by men, if only Apollo and the rest of the immortal gods are proprietors toward us. They spoke, and he took the bow and put it back where it had been in fear, since many men were shouting at him in the palace. But from the other side, Telemachus spoke and threatened him. Keep on with the bow, old fellow. You cannot do what everyone tells you. Take care, or younger though I am, I might chase you out to the fields with a shower of stones. I am stronger than you are. I only wish I were as, strong, were as much stronger and more of a fighter with my hands than all these suitors who are here in my household, so I could hatefully speed any man of them on his journey out of our house where they are contriving evils against us. So he spoke, and all the suitors laughed happily at him, and all gave over their bitter rage against Telem Telemachus. The swineherd took up the bow and carried it through the palace and stood beside the wise Odysseus and handed it to him. Then he called aside the nurse, Eurycleia, and told her, Circumspect Eurycleia, Tele Telemachus wants you to bar the tightly fitted doors that close the house. And then if any of you hear from inside the crash and the outcry of men who are caught within our toils, you must not peep in from outside, but simply sit still at your work in silence. So he spoke, and she had no winged words for an answer. Eurycleia barred the doors of the strong-built great hall. Philodius sprang to his feet and went silently outside to the house, and then he closed the doors of the well-made courtyard. Lying beneath the portico was a fiber cable for an oar-driven ship. With that, he made fast the doors and himself went in and sat again on the chair from which he had risen, looking toward Odysseus, who by now was handling the bow, turning it all up and down and testing it from one side and another to see if worms had eaten the horn in the master's absence. And thus would one of them say as he looked across at the next man, This man is an admirer of bows, or one who steals them. Now either he has such things lying back away in his own house, or else he is studying to make one, the way he turns it, this way and that, our vagabond who is versed in villainies. And thus would speak another one of these arrogant young men, how I wish his share of good fortune were the same measure as is the degree of his power ever to get it, this bow strung. So the suitors talked, but now resourceful Odysseus, once he had taken up the great bow and looked it all over, as when a man who well understands the lyre and singing easily, holding it on either side, pulls a strongly twisted cord of sheep's gut, so as to slip it over a new peg, so without any strain, Odysseus strung the bow. Then, plucking in his right hand, he tested the bowstring, and it gave him back an excellent sound like the voice of a swallow. A great sorrow fell now upon the suitors, and all their color was changed. And Zeus, Zeus, showing forth his portents, thundered mightily. Hearing this, 
long-suffering great Odysseus was happy that the son of devious devising Kronos had sent him a portent. He chose out a swift arrow that lay beside him uncovered on the table, but the others were still stored up inside the hollow quiver, and presently the Achaeans must learn their nature. Taking the string and the head grooves, he drew to the middle grip, and from the very chair where he sat, bending the bow before him, let the arrow fly, nor missed any axis from the first handle on, but the bronze-weighted arrow passed through all and out the other end. He spoke to Telemachus. Telemachus, your guest that sits in your halls does not then fail you. I missed no part of the mark, nor have I made much work of stringing the bow. The strength is still sound within me, and not as the suitors said in their scorn, making little of me. Now is the time for their dinner to be served, the Achaeans in the daylight, then follow with other entertainment, the dance and the lyre, for these things come to the end of the feasting. He spoke, and nodded at him with his brows, and Telemachus, dear son of godlike Odysseus, put a sharp sword about him, and closed his own hand over his spear, and took his position close beside him, and next to the chair, all armed in bright bronze.